uh, with us today, Dr. S uh, Sophie Richardson. Uh, and thank you to all the students and faculty for joining us here today. So as I'm sure you all saw in her bio, a very impressive background. And all things Chinese political reform, democratization, and human rights. So I'm confident we'll have lots of things to talk about today. Um, our former uh, DGS professor, McNair, saw her at an event and thought she would be an amazing person to come and speak to our program. So we're thrilled to have you here today, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, sorry. I spend a lot of my time talking to people in governments. I actually love coming and talking to people on campuses because it feels a little bit more human um, and has an opportunity for interaction. Um, I would be, I, I'm, my goal here is to not talk for very long, partly because I'd really like to respond and talk about what you guys are interested in, including how to get a job in the human rights field, which is often a popular topic. Um, but let me maybe spend 15 or 20 minutes just giving you a quick rundown on what HRW is, what our work on China looks like, what we think is happening under Xi Jinping, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about how you wind up uh, in this universe. And actually, let's do this. Raise your hand if you've heard of Human Rights Watch. Okay, great, terrific. So you have a reasonable familiarity with who we are and what we do. Um, we are a research and advocacy organization. Uh, we're now about 400 people worldwide. We work in 90 different countries. Uh, the staff comes from 68 different countries, I'm pleased to report. Um, you know, our goal is to go out and do research on human rights violations, to document them uh, and ground them in the context of international law. Did I hit the wrong button? Okay. I'm awful with technology, so I'm not going to touch anything. Yeah, so that should work better for you. Can everybody hear okay? Yeah. All right, great, terrific. Um, so our researchers go out and speak to people who are victims of human rights violations. Uh, they try to speak to the people who are responsible for protecting those people in the first place or who might be in a position to fix the problem. And typically what we wind up doing is publishing reports like the ones that are making their way around the room uh, that are largely about substantiating the problem itself, uh, but also making recommendations about how to fix the problem. Uh, and one of our real goals is to make recommendations that are not, as my mother would say, don't stick beans up your nose, that aren't painfully obvious, or things that you know, governments or militaries or concerned parties have already tried to do. Um, sometimes when we set out to do projects, that fact alone will generate enough interest from the government, for example, to step in and try harder to fix a problem such that we don't even necessarily have to publish a full-fledged report in order to get attention. We consider those projects to be just as successful, if not more so, than ones that really do require a great deal of public exposure because that is one of the other pieces of the, of the equation of our work, which is to you know, widely publicize human rights violations. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about a report we put out last week about Xinjiang, which is the northwestern part of China, um, and some pretty off the charts abuses there. But getting press attention often helps bring pressure to bear, you know, on members of governments, parliaments, militaries, the UN, whoever is in a position to make change. Um, the organization is basically structured into two different kinds of researchers. There are regional researchers who have an expertise on a particular country or area and or have a, a particular language facility. And we also have marvelous colleagues, so all of my work is within the Asia Division. We have extraordinary colleagues who work in what are known as the thematic programs. And those are people who are experts on everything from children's rights to women's rights to uh, what kinds of weapons can be used in conflict, uh, all the way through to health and human rights, the rights of the elderly. And often what happens is that we have um, a person from each side of the house partnering together to do research so that we've got sort of the functional expertise coupled with the country expertise. Um, people often ask what our standards are. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and this, this typically comes up in a conversation where people are saying, well, aren't human rights just a Western conspiracy to keep X and such country or community down? Um, and so I think it's very important to understand that the, the standards that we use are the ones as enshrined in international law, right? The six or eight covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention to Eliminate Discrimination, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, I won't name them all because we'll all die of boredom. 
Um, but there are also a number of other now agreed upon sets of principles, for example, in business and human rights, that we take, you know, we, we can't give those necessarily the same weight as binding international law, but we do take those as standards that different kinds of players should aspire to. Uh, you know, so when we're, when we're talking about what standards governments are falling short of, or militaries or companies or whoever, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about U.S. foreign policy or U.S. conduct as a metric for human rights behavior. We're not talking about what the EU does or any other particular government. It really is those treaties as they are interpreted by experts on international human rights law. Um, we can certainly come back to that if you would like. Um, I have been a human rights watch. It's exhausting. Um, I've been a human rights watch since 2006. I have overseen our work on China that whole time. Um, the topics that we cover have ranged all the way from access to education for children with disabilities in rural areas. China was one of the first uh, signatories in Asia to the Convention uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and we wanted to take a look at how it was doing fulfilling its obligations. The short answer was not great. Um, all the way through to a project we did last year looking at the ways the Chinese government is seeking to weaken the key uh, human rights institutions within the UN. Um, that gets Byzantine fast if you don't speak UN ease. Uh, but you know, the UN is really one of the only bodies left particularly for activists from the mainland to go to with concerns about what's happening in their own country because often they can't get local courts to take cases. Uh, and so it's very important that those bodies remain open to activists and organizations from all over the world. And part of the point that we wanted to make was that it wasn't just people who had concerns about China who were effectively getting shut out of UN mechanisms, but in fact organizations or individuals who didn't necessarily themselves work on China but, had, but their own work had in some way offended uh, the Chinese government. And so they too were having trouble getting accredited the kind of uh, uh, documentation that an NGO needs to participate in events at the Human Rights Council, for example, or prevent it from speaking in certain forums. Um, you know, so we find ourselves now balancing between documenting abuses that are taking place inside China and actually documenting abuses that are taking place uh, as a result of Chinese government behavior outside of China. And that's everything from labor issues to things like the UN project. We'll probably look in the coming year or so at issues around the Belt and Road Initiative where major infrastructure projects are taking place in contexts that don't really have any sort of safeguards in place or functional legal systems or free presses, and where you know, being an activist, uh, criticizing these kinds of proposals or these kinds of projects can be a pretty dangerous proposition. And Xi Jinping's tenure has marked an extraordinary regression of human rights in China. And if you look at the trajectory, the progress that was made over the 90s and the aughts in everything from you know, the rise of an extraordinary civil society movement, which really ranged all the way from, you know, individual, <coughs> excuse me, uh, individual government critics who were literary theorists who worked largely on their own and published criticisms of the government, all the way through to, you know, tiny local NGOs in rural areas that ran public libraries or provided health services. You know, this was a phenomenal and unbelievably encouraging development across the country, really the profusion of domestic civil society. That community in particular has taken it in the neck <laughs> under Xi Jinping. And I think the first warning sign that we saw was about six months after he came into power and had already launched a signature anti-corruption initiative. It was really sort of a flagship effort of his tenure in office. And some of the first civil society activists who got arrested in the fall of 2014 were anti-corruption activists. And these were people who were essentially standing on street corners holding up signs that effectively echoed what senior party leaders were saying in their own rhetoric about, the, about uh, battling corruption, except that they weren't part of the government. And so that kind of public criticism or public advocacy was deemed unacceptable early on. And since that time, uh, it, was, it was the following summer that in the space of just a few days across the country, that this tiny community of human rights lawyers and legal aid activists, about 300 people, were all detained by local authorities in, I think it was 19 different provinces. And it was very clearly a warning shot to that community that they should stop advocating on behalf of different kinds of rights abuses. Most of those people were eventually let go 
but the vast majority of them have either been disbarred, so they've been stripped of their licenses and can't practice. Um, a couple of them are still being detained. Several of them have been prosecuted and given very harsh sentences. Uh, Xi's government has also taken the view that in order to claim to adhere to the rule of law, they were going to adopt a slew of laws on everything from national security and counterterrorism to charity and the management of foreign NGOs that sort of created a veneer of legal legitimacy. But the, the bulk of the content of those laws is wildly in tension, not just with multiple different parts of China's constitution and other laws that guarantee rights, but almost all of China's obligations under the international human rights law. Uh, and that's a particularly bitter uh, trend, I think, because, again, over the 90s and the aughts, you really saw the professionalization of the court system. Um, you know, thousands of lawyers and judges being trained. Uh, you know, a much more functional, predictable uh, legal architecture in place. But a lot of the gains, if you're trying to uh, assert any sort of power over the government, simply can't play out in court now. And in fact, huge swaths of behavior are now easily considered criminal conduct under a lot of these laws. Um, the third area, there, there are many we could talk about, but in addition to civil society uh, and, and <coughs> excuse me, these problematic laws, the third area that's worth spending a minute talking about maybe of particular interest to people who, who are working on surveillance issues and technology is the extraordinary use by the current Chinese government of surveillance technology to monitor and modify behavior. Um, some of you will have read about what's called the social credit system, which is essentially a, a state-driven effort to try to gather huge amounts of data about individuals and then reward them or punish them with access to state services, depending on uh, how they're doing. Hi, nice to see you. Um, that's um, we started writing about these issues about 18 months ago, and the more we wrote, the more we found uh, to be concerned about. And I think uh, we kind of bottomed out when we discovered that under the guise of a free public health care program, the Xinjiang regional government was gathering biodata, including DNA samples from everybody in the entire region, including children, uh, without their knowledge or consent or any information about how that data was going to be used. Uh, we've written about predictive policing programs. We've written about facial and voice recognition. You know, we think the government's longer-term goal really is essentially to make people acutely aware all the time, all the time, that their behavior is being monitored and can be known and can and will be held against them, even if the conduct in question is in no way a violation of a discernible law. And that's a that's a pretty frightening thing, you know, when you stop and, and sort of spin out the longer-term consequences. Um, let me say a quick word just about the two reports that are going around the room because those are two of our most recent projects. There's one that looks at gender discrimination in job ads. Um, for those of you who spend any time in China, it is very easy to see job ads that say things like, only men need apply for a job. And you look at it and you think, what? <laughs> you know, there's, uh, or, or men preferred or women need not apply. It's still very common in China for women to be asked in job interviews whether they're married, if they've had kids, if they intend to have kids. Uh, and we actually started looking at this around the 2008 Olympics when many of the ads for positions for things like flag bearers or you know hosts or things like that clearly stipulated that you had to be that women had to be a particular height. Their eyes had to be only so far apart. Their teeth had to be perfectly light, right? I mean, there were these incredibly specific physical descriptions that, among other things, you didn't see necessarily stipulated for men. And one of the problems in China is that the laws governing things like discrimination and job ads are very vague. You know, so they'll, they say, literally, you may not discriminate against women. But then there's nothing else to go on that would make it fairly straightforward as a legal matter to take a case to court. And so we wanted to have a look at that. <laughs> Along the way, we were also noticing that a number of the big, well-known Chinese tech companies like Alibaba, Huawei, Baidu, also run uh, mostly, on, they do most of their recruiting online now, uh, and that they tended to do so using wildly sexualized images of women, often with messages that effectively said, hey guys, want a great job in coding and work with hot babes? <laughs> 
come apply here. I'm not making this up. You can go online and look at the multimedia piece we put together with this report. I love the look on your face. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you can see some of these ads. Uh, you know, it, it, it does. There's a way in which it seems comical to us, you know, for people who, you know, who've had some exposure to why that's not okay and what would happen to a company. Uh, if it ran an ad, like, I mean, imagine Facebook doing that and Google. We all know what would happen fairly quickly. Um, it's too bad the same consequences won't apply for building censorship apps for the Chinese government, but that's a separate issue. Um, so we decided to look both at government job ads. The, the National Civil Service job ads are all posted once a year, and they, too, include <laughs> stipulations that say only women need apply. Uh, so we looked at those, and we looked at ads put up by these big tech companies. And in, as, as is often the way when we're doing research projects, you know, we wrote to uh, the agency that's responsible for the civil service job ads, and we wrote to all of the tech companies and said, you can see the letters in the back of the report, and said, we're doing research on this topic, uh, here's what we found, can you please explain to us your answers to the following questions? And of course, especially the companies all ignored us. Um, the Chinese government almost never replies to anything we send them. And we were launching a report in Hong Kong on a Monday. And when we put reports out, we put them out embargo so the journalists have a few days to read them before they're allowed to report on them, because you can't expect somebody to digest a 100-page report um, in a couple of hours. And when all, when, so when the embargo version of the report went out, and all of the, you know, Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, you know, international media started calling the press offices of Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent and Huawei and saying, why are you guys running these ads? Um, they all panicked. Um, well, a number of them denied them. One company had the guts to say, wow, we really shouldn't do that. And by the time we actually formally launched the report on Monday, all those ads were gone. Um, in our view, that's a victory. Because <laughs> the goal is that companies shouldn't advertise in that way. The next test will be when the next round of civil service job listings goes up in about three weeks to see if there are any changes there. We'll be keeping an eye on that. So that's one project. Um, another more serious one is a report we put out last Monday about uh, mass political indoctrination camps in Xinjiang, where credible estimates now suggest up to a million people are being detained essentially for not demonstrating sufficient political loyalty to the government, <coughs> excuse me, or to the party. Um, we've documented people being detained for doing as little as, you know, reading from the Quran at a wedding or a funeral or even in services in the privacy of their own homes. Um, the fact that many of the people in question, these are mostly ethnic Turkic uh, Muslim communities, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Hui, uh, for having for having or having spent time having family members that are having spent time in other countries, and that's considered evidence of political disloyalty. Uh, and these camps have arisen essentially to indoctrinate people uh, until they're considered to be sufficiently loyal and then they can leave. And it's really uh, uh, unlike anything that we have seen in 30 years of tracking human rights abuses in China, the scope and the scale of this campaign, and the near blanket denial uh, by the government, which has, under some pressure, tried to explain either that these are small scale uh, facilities <laughs> designed exclusively for de-radicalization, um, for which they provided no evidence, or it's a claim for which they provided no evidence, or that they're vocational training centers, to which we say, really? With barbed wire and armed guards? What kind of job do you get for being able to parrot Xi Jinping thought? You know, what, what kind of career prospects are there for the 72-year-old man who was beaten because he wasn't learning Mandarin fast enough. What job does that get you? Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the explanations really don't hold water. And it will be an enormous advocacy challenge trying to get the Chinese government both to shut these things down uh, since it doesn't think it's doing anything wrong. Uh, it's an enormous advocacy challenge because uh, Xinjiang is tough to get at, unlike uh, the Rohingya in Burma, another hideously persecuted uh, Muslim community in Asia. You know, it's much harder for journalists to actually get to Xinjiang to film what's happening. Um, it also throws up, and for those of you who are doing legal related work, it throws up a really tough question that we've wrestled with internally about what international law and justice mechanisms make room for. Um, and by that I mean if you're actually envisioning trying to prosecute a government 
for something like crimes against humanity or genocide, as in fact the, uh, the fact-finding mission on Burma has just started talking about today in Geneva. You know, there's, a, there's a certain perception of what something like a crime against humanity actually constitutes if you're trying to prosecute it, and it usually assumes a certain amount of kinetic violence, murder, rape, uh, torture. Uh, and there's a sense that what's happening in Xinjiang isn't violent enough to reach that threshold. And we can have, I'd be perfectly happy to have a heated debate <laughs> about whether that's the right way to go. But among other things, it shows, I think, that international uh, justice mechanisms are still very, that they're still very narrow, or that the pathways to making good use of them are pretty narrow. Um, I'm going to stop there on the substance, but we're, I'm perfectly happy to come back to any of that, because again, I promise not to talk too long. Um, there are a lot of paths to human rights work, and it's a universe that is vast, right? Um, you, know, you may think of it as working for something like Human Rights Watch or working for DRL at the State Department, um, but as I was on my way over here, I tried to make a list of all of the different kinds of people I have interacted with in the last week. Um, so we had journalists, academics, lawyers, doctors, forensic science, scientists, forensic accountants. I did not know such things existed. Um, more different kinds of technological specialists that I know how to count, especially people who are experts in satellite imagery. Um, you know, and many of those people certainly consider themselves to be working in the human rights field. Um, so don't ever assume that there's sort of one and only one true path. There are a lot of different ways to get there. Um, I'm very glad, personally, that I realized early on which parts of human rights work I am better and better at than others. Um, I have colleagues who I am in awe of for their incredible ability to sit, you know, often in very difficult circumstances for hours and hours and hours and days at a time and interview people who have been through hell and back and to speak to them with extraordinary respect and dignity. I have never once seen my colleagues crack. I have never once seen them feel sorry for themselves. Uh, you know, occasionally people decide they've had enough and they go do something else. I'm not good at that. I crack in those circumstances. <laughs> you know, the, the, the couple of times I've gone out and done research projects like that, all it's done is remind me that I'm really good at yelling at politicians. Really good at it. And um, that's, that's a piece of the puzzle that, that I do really well at. You know, I can understand what their constraints are, I can understand what you could ask them to do, you know, and figure out what they've done in the past and pitch what we want to those particular interests. You know, I have colleagues who uh, you know, come from very different backgrounds. And so in that, in that spirit, I will give you just the, the following advice. I mean, there's also, look, there's also the whole realm of service provisions. You know, one of my colleagues at Human Rights Watch jokes that we don't actually do anything. Right? <laughs> that, that doing research and yelling at people doesn't really constitute actually making a contribution. You know, so there, I mean, there's a massive world of relief agencies, of organizations that provide support to torture survivors. You know, there, we live in a world with you know, millions of NGOs that do everything from literacy programs to looking after you know, kids who've been separated from their parents either in China or on the US-Mexico border, right? I mean, so again, it's, 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 a, it's a big universe. Don't think it's just one thing. Um, that said, here are the things that you must be able to do well. <laughs> um, and, you know, look, you're in one of the best places in the world to hone, to acquire and hone all of these skills. Learn how to write well. It is amazing how much that counts. <laughs> Being able to convey ideas clearly on paper counts for a lot. If you can do it in more than one language, bonus points. Um, have good research skills, because I think even in any of those different kinds of realms I just sketched out, you really need to know how to go out and find good information uh, and be able to explain why you take the position you do based on the facts that you have found. Uh, I would take advantage of any opportunity that's afforded to you, whether it's in a class, whether it's in a club, you know, to both try out your skills, public speaking, um, or persuading people of anything and or, this is not the least one, um, you know, take a chance and try to go out and propose some kind of change about something. Doesn't matter what it is, but go and try to change something and see how that goes and then think about it six months later and see if it worked or if it didn't, why it didn't, 
or whether it's something that you can build on, or whether it's something you really care about. You know, when a million resumes come floating across my desk when we're hiring, for example, a new researcher, part of what I want to see is not necessarily that people have worked at certain kinds of institutions or even done certain kinds of things. I want to see something that says, I care about the universe enough to go out and undertake some kind of activity to try to make the world a slightly better place. I really don't care what that is. I care that people be able to demonstrate some kind of initiative and go out next to you. I don't even care if, you, if it didn't work, <laughs> right? I think it's that, it's that impulse to go out and try to make positive change. So, with all of that said, several people have already been told that they have to ask good, hard questions. I'm gonna stop there, and you're welcome to ask me whatever you like. Yeah, all I ask is just tell me who you are and either where you're from or what you're studying or something interesting about yourself. Yeah. I'm Ida, I'm from Finland. Uh, what kind of laws does China have right now regarding foreign funding of NGOs in the country? Yeah, one of, um, ironically, one of, the, one of the new laws that caused more consternation than anything else uh, is the new foreign NGO management law that came into effect on January 1st, 2017. Uh, and it sets out a series of requirements for foreign NGOs uh, that are <laughs> quite draconian and effectively make it impossible for any foreign NGO to operate in China outside the very clear line of sight and control of government authorities. Um, you, ha you now have to have uh, what's called a professional supervisor unit uh, which is a government agency that will be your partner. Uh, you have to provide extensive documentation, not just about where, <laughs> excuse me, your funding comes from, meaning, so if you are, I'm making this up, if you are Save the Children, you and you want to operate in China, you don't just have to hand over information about money that you are either raising or spending in China, you have to hand over information about money you're raising worldwide. Um, but arguably most important or most problematic is that the Public Security Bureau now has the power uh, to review and approve your work plans, right? So the police get to decide what NGOs get to do. Uh, and you know, it, was, it is one of a series of steps the government has taken in the last couple of years to really try to separate uh, domestic NGOs uh, from their foreign counterparts. And this caused an enormous brouhaha internationally because all of a sudden, I mean, groups like mine, you know, were, never stood a snowball's chance of getting registered. And you know, we, we are registered in Hong Kong anyway, so that's, we're fine, um, at least for the moment. Um, <laughs> it can always change. But all of a sudden, you know, some of the very big, long-established international foundations, you know, the Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, uh, Museums, universities, service providers, uh, business associations, you know, a lot of the international organizations that for a long time had said, we're here, it's fine, no problem. All of a sudden we're facing the same kinds of constraints that Chinese NGOs <laughs> have always had to put up with. Uh, and it's really had a remarkable effect. I would, I would, if you're interested more about this, I would look at a wonderful project done by a group called China Files, China FILE, um, on who's been able to register, uh, because the numbers who successfully registered are very small. Uh, they tend to be, <coughs> excuse me, primarily in Beijing. They tend to work on very sort of safe areas of work that the government mm -hmm. likes. Uh, you know, and it came at the same time as a lesser noticed set of regulations for Chinese NGOs that effectively forced them to register either as advocacy organizations or as service providers, uh, and that they couldn't they couldn't mix the two kinds of work. And you know, many people <coughs> from those organizations, being very resourceful creatures that they are, have found ways around some of those regulations. But it was a very clear effort to both cut domestic NGOs off from their international counterparts to control what international NGOs can do inside China. You know, and to further put constraints on domestic groups, and, you know, which again has had rotten consequences for this community that really was thriving for so long. Uh, yeah, go ahead, the green t-shirt. Uh, 
No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again for coming and speaking to us, uh, Dr. Richardson. Uh, my name is Paul Gill. My question is why, you said China, the new government has taken a step back uh, under Xi Jinping in relation to human rights. Why, what are the reasons behind that? Why is this regime any different than the past ones? What has driven them to make those changes? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think if you rounded up all of Georgetown's China experts, we'd be here for a week and a half debating this. Um, so, so on my list, we have uh, you know a highly authoritarian leader uh, and and you know a second tier of leaders right under him. <laughs> excuse me, um, who are uh, quite hostile to criticism and dissent. There's a very different mindset, I think, in this leadership about projecting China as a, a successful, developmentally oriented, positive, problem-free society and nation. Uh, you know, and given the other things that are going on in the world today, that, that PR message is doing reasonably well amongst uncritical communities. Um, you know, one of my personal pet peeves, if I may digress for just a moment, you know, is, is you know, people who will, or, or governments or leaders who will be critical of Trump for some particular behavior, but it doesn't even occur to them that Xi Jinping is, in most cases, just as bad. <laughs> uh, and, and, but, you know, largely because he remains fairly calm in public at all times, and it's an extremely disciplined regime. Uh, they always, I think, look very professional and together, uh, and, you know, trying to get people to reconcile this very calm, cool, collective-looking leadership you know, with the rise of a million arbitrarily detained Muslims. You know, I, I have had heads of government, heads of state say to me, that can't be true. You know, they literally can't rec reconcile the kinds of human rights abuses that we document with a leadership that looks so uh, uh, together to them. Um, I do think that there are, that, that the leadership is less unified than it wants the rest of the world to believe, or especially than it wants the population of China to believe. Um, you know, even even in highly authoritarian regimes, there's a lot of competition and jockeying going on, and so you know, she has very successfully eliminated some of his rivals, mostly under the guise of the anti-corruption campaign. And but this is also a particular set of leaders who have uh, an axe to grind historically, and a view of what China's role in the world ought to be, and that more of the world ought to be like China, which really is different from previous leaderships. And I think that's why you see a, an enormous change between, say, 10 years ago and now with respect to actually trying to change international norms and institutions. Uh, for the first time ever, the Chinese government actually introduced a resolution at the Human Rights Council in Geneva about human rights. Uh, and they were, you know, they were they were smart in how they went about doing it. In that, the first draft they presented, you know, they knew there would be, there was going to be a certain amount of pushback, right? Um, so the, the first draft they presented was awful. It was, I mean, it was so awful that even the governments that will never say China is doing anything awful said, "Guys, this is kind of awful. We can't support this." You know, and so they made some very modest changes. So it was only a little bit less awful, at least in our view, um, and it won by. 30 to 13. It got 30 votes in support. No, it wasn't 30 to 13. It got 30 votes in support. There were 13 abstentions, and only one government, the US, actually voted against it. It was very clear to us that in the language that China was proposing in this resolution, the happy news, at least for the moment, folks, is that these things are not binding. So there's a way in which it doesn't matter. But it's very clear to us that the language that's being tried out, and particularly the idea that you know, only that states are the only actors in human rights issues, not civil society or independent human beings, is clearly a shot at eventually changing, trying to amend the laws and the treaties. And that should frighten people, right? Because those, those are, uh, you know, those are really the core of the international human rights movement and the protections that protect us all everywhere. You know, and then last but not least, governments are, not just governments, companies are terrified to challenge China. They're afraid of it. And there's a lot of money at stake. You know, I mean, the, the head of you know the heads of companies like Google and Facebook have made more money than they could ever possibly imagine spending in their lives, and yet, you know, they're perfectly happy to chuck aside any principles they claim to have to make more money 
you know, by designing software that that's, suits the Chinese government right down to the ground in aiding state censorship. Yeah. So it's not just that people won't push back, it's that they want in and to make a buck. And that's a pretty big problem. Yeah, go ahead. Tim. Yeah, just in class. Oh, me. Okay, yeah. Um, my name's Christina. I'm from North Carolina. Um, so I was going to ask you, first of all, what was the most rewarding moment of your career so far in doing your rights work? Um, and then also, how do you find the energy every day to continue working in this field when you see what you see every single day? Tell me first if your family's okay. Yes, they're okay. Thank good. you. Good. Yeah, good. they're okay. Um, wow. Uh, okay. Let me do the second one first. Okay. Um, there is the reality that I have the world's most gorgeous 12-year-old son, um, who, even though he's in seventh grade now, a little bit stroppy, is a delight to get to every day. Um, uh, you know, look, I got to grow up in a world in which all, all my rights are protected, um, and I believe that one's karmic obligation is to go out and make that happen for other people. Um, I'm not quite sure how I wound up getting produced that way. You know, my parents were involved in the civil rights movement in the US. Uh, I went to Oberlin, where a commitment to social justice is not optional, um, which is why I went there. Uh, you know, and I, got, I also was given a number of opportunities very early on, including when I was an undergrad, you know, to try my hand at some of this stuff. And I think when you see that you can contribute to some kind of positive change, wow, and the idea that somebody will pay you to do that, there's kind of no going back. Um, well, the other question is a little bit hard to answer. Uh, there's nothing like meeting somebody you've helped get out of jail. That's a pretty mind-boggling experience. Um, I had the enormous privilege of representing Human Rights Watch at uh, the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize ceremonies in Oslo when Leo Shapovalov was awarded the prize in absentia. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting his widow, Leo Xia, in Berlin soon. I will cry a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's never about us. It's about supporting people who are putting a lot on the line to fight for improvements in their own places. And so I think, you know, or, you know on certain issues or the places they live in, I think whenever we feel a little bit, a little bit down, you pull up the file of people you know, who are risking a hell of a lot more than we ever will, and you think, okay, back to work. Um, but I will say, because I think this is an important, an increasingly important piece of human rights work too, that um, people do burn out, and people do work too hard. Sometimes people sort of tip over the edge and can't stop working. Um, we as an organization are getting somewhat better about taking care of our own folks, which for a long time we weren't very good at and I'm one of the co-chairs of our Stress and Resilience Task Force. Um, you know, but it's something to be mindful of. You know, and look, I was, I was not cut out for you know, interviewing hundreds of victims in a refugee camp. I, I was terrible at it. I would just fall apart, and then I was not useful to other people. I wasn't useful to my organization. I was a mess myself. And, you know, I spent a couple of months thinking, my God, I've chosen the wrong line of work, and then I just realized I was sort of in the wrong bit of it. Um, so I think a certain amount of healthy self-reflection is, is wise, too. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, in the back, in red. Uh, my name's Evan. I study international security, and I'm particularly Share interested. for me. Uh, I, I'm particularly interested in the intersection of development and security. Um, and a question related to your work in China. Without having an official presence there for Human Rights Watch, what are the ways that uh, you're able to gather information on the ground and some of the most important methods for doing that? Carefully is the most important part of the puzzle. And, you know, we watch a lot of organizations decide to try to have a presence. This is pre foreign and geo management law, try to have a presence in the mainland. And, you know, on the, the perfectly logical assumption that it might give them either better access to information or better access to government officials with whom they could interact to try to, you know, influence policies. Um, but we've also seen a lot of those in organizations then really get hemmed in in terms of what they could say or do because they were afraid of getting kicked out. Uh, and I think it's been the right decision for us to try to do our work in other ways. And we do certainly try always as a starting point 
to do live in-person interviews done by our staff if that is possible. Um, that's become exponentially more difficult in the last five to seven years. Um, you know, there are times when we're working on an issue that is, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, um, not terribly incendiary and we've been able still to send somebody quietly in to do research themselves or ourselves. Um, you know, the wonders of modern technology are such that we don't necessarily need people to come out, but we can talk to them in other ways. We don't love doing interviews electronically because we feel that <coughs> and there's, there's sort of an additional layer of work involved, you know, in corroborating that the person you're talking to is who they say they are, that they had the experience they said they had. Uh, yeah, that's a different proposition when you're having that conversation over the phone than when somebody's sitting in front of you and you can read body language or sort of go back to certain conversations more easily. Um, it's also just, it's, it's a very different kind of conversation to, you know, to ask somebody about being tortured over the phone than when you can sit there with them and sort of, you know, have that conversation in a more, um, you know, in a very supportive manner. Uh, we have done whole projects, uh, particularly, <coughs> excuse me, about um, especially closed off parts of the country, past projects, uh, particularly about Tibet, uh, based on what's reported in state media. You know, one of, the <laughs> one of the upsides of an authoritarian state media is that they will present as evidence of public policy triumphs what we see as evidence of human rights abuses. Um, and you know, that's, that's been one useful strategy. You know, people come out of the country, and often that's not necessarily a representative sample. Um, you know, for this project we just did about Xinjiang, many of the people that we interviewed were in Kazakhstan uh, because there are, there are a lot of Kazakh families who are sort of divided, Uyghurs as well. Um, you know, part of the reason that we did the job ads report uh, was because the Chinese government effectively had presented us an entire database, you know, of 36,000 job listings, you know, 15 to 20 percent of which said, you know, had some, expressed some preference for a gender. We didn't need to go and talk to anybody. The evidence was right there. And, you know, and then there are projects that we're doing that are almost entirely outside of China. For example, the work on the UN. We did a project a couple of years ago about um, labor abuses in Chinese SOEs uh, that ran copper mines in Zambia. And we always, always, always try to get a response from the government in advance of publication um, and to have a conversation with them after the fact. I actually ran into Ambassador Tsai Kai, Kai, who's the who's Chinese ambassador at the US outside the State Department the other day. This is the day we released the Xinjiang report. And I'd met him a couple of times before, and I went over and reintroduced myself and asked if we could have a conversation about the report. And he sort of hesitated and then said, sort of relented and said, well, send me a copy. And I said, well, we send you a copy every time we put a report out, and you guys send them back unopened. But I'm perfectly happy to try again. Um, <laughs> You know, so it's, it's, it's one of the only governments in the world now that won't engage Human Rights Watch directly. You know, and that's a club that includes North Korea, Zimbabwe, Venezuela. Uh, you know, but one, one tries <laughs> wherever one can. But, you know, our greatest obligation is to make sure that the people we've interviewed don't get in more trouble by virtue of having spoken to us. So we do spend a lot of time figuring out how to both get the information but, but to keep people safe. Yeah, that's in the, in the back. Okay. Uh, Corbin, uh, from Wisconsin, I'm studying U.S. national security policy. Uh, if what China's doing in Xinjiang works to their satisfaction, what do you think that portends for exporting the, the technology they're using, the tactics they're using elsewhere? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and even if I, I thought you were going to say, what does Xinjiang look like 10 years from now? Um, which is kind of terrifying. But in a way, the writing was well on the wall between five and 10 years ago. And you presumably will have followed the debate here about ZTE uh, quite closely. Uh, we actually did a report about seven years ago about ZTE not just selling surveillance, telephone surveillance technology, voice recognition software, but also providing the training to the Ethiopian government that was using that technology and those skills uh, to monitor conversations to be able to identify its critics. You know, I mean, it's, it is really not hard to see 
you know, first of all, the very close relationship between a lot of the big Chinese tech companies and the state security apparatus. And those companies, you know, many of them are now being represented by K Street firms, or, you know, they have R&D offices in California. Uh, and I think that presents enormous threats to things like the freedom of expression worldwide. You know, Hike Vision, we were just looking at Hike Vision, which has uh, uh, sort of a spin-off of the PLA, uh, has, is represented uh, by a number of K Street law firms and has been found, it was the US-China Economic and Security Commission that wrote last year about finding Hike Vision made cameras on US military videos. Uh, you know, so a little bit more advanced thought into where stuff is being sourced from it might be a good idea. I was in Australia in August um, and picked up the newspaper one day. They were having a huge debate about whether Huawei should be one of the providers of 5G services. And I picked up one of the newspapers one day. It was a full page ad that said, it was run by Huawei, that said one in two Australians already rely on Huawei for 5G services. And I thought, one in two, do one in two Australians know that all their data is getting sent off to police-run databases in China. You, know, you might want to think this through, guys. Uh, but I think the rise of that kind of technology and its happy consumption, happy unthinking consumption by the outside world is really problematic. You know, when you hit that accept terms of service button, when you're buying something through Alibaba, what's happening to your personal data? People should be asking themselves those questions. Yeah, here in the, the green shirt. <coughs> Jonathan Wirtz. Um, I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about the history with human rights violations in Tibet and with the movement of the provincial governor to Xinjiang, how that might relate to Xinjiang and maybe forecast what's to come in the future. Yeah, I think, so So the, the man your classmate is referring to here is named Chen Chuanghua, who was the Tibet party secretary from 20... 2013 to 2016. Um, somebody should check that. Um, and while he was the party secretary to that, he, among other things, radically expanded different kinds of security apparatus across uh, Tibetan areas, uh, including, you know, it's much more low tech there. Uh, I think the government <coughs> perceives a different kind of threat. So it's both a lot of security cameras and checkpoints that people have to go through. But in Tibet, the government has chosen a strategy that's a little bit more reliant on human beings in that we've seen staggering numbers of government and party officials be deployed across the plateau to live for long periods of time in certain kinds of communities um, or to effectively be installed in the management of monastic communities. Um, so Chen Chuanghua moved to Xinjiang, where he became the party secretary at the end of August 2016, where clearly either he was given license to or he recommended far more brass knuckled tactics. Uh, you know, the Chinese government perceives Uyghurs and Tibetans quite differently. Um, I, they're certainly both considered enormously politically suspect and disloyal. It clearly views Uyghurs as uh, more threatening and potentially more violent and potentially linked to international uh, violent Islamic groups, even though it's never really substantiated that claim. It's used it as a pretext for massive repression, but it's never really substantiated that claim. And that's why I think you've seen much more intrusive surveillance measures. Um, it's very common in uh, cities in <coughs> Xinjiang now to see QR codes outside people's homes, which makes it easier for police to use certain specially designed apps to gather and store information about how often the residents in that particular home pray, whether they have family members overseas. Yeah, again, I wish I had a camera here. Not, I mean, not, the, not the surveillance camera, but not the <laughs> Just the looks of incredulity. Um, you know, and incredibly uh, tight restrictions on movement, even to be able to go, say, from, you know, here to a different part of DC, you would have to get permission from local authorities, let alone be able to leave the region, let alone be able to leave the country. Passports have all been confiscated. Uh, it's very difficult to get them back. You know, and then we've seen this much more aggressive approach to changing people's thoughts, essentially. Uh, you know, 10 years from now, I think in Xinjiang, it will be acceptable to be you know, a distinct 
ethnic human being so long as all of your behaviors and your thoughts are loyal to the party and the government. And that means not having any kind of uh, identity to an Islamic community, to a Turkic community, to communities that live in other countries, such that your political loyalties might be divided. Um, but the Tibet situation is also different because uh, the Dalai Lama exists and is a globally known figure to lead and speak for in that community. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very differently organized diaspora community uh, that in some ways has been more effective politically. You know, Uyghurs have been saddled, <laughs> excuse me, by among other things, the US uh, brainlessly putting uh, supposedly threatening uh, Xinjiang affiliated terrorist groups on things like terrorist watch lists. Uh, which really helped buttress Beijing's claim that it really did face a serious threat. It took ages for one of those designations to get removed, mostly because nobody could really prove that that, that organization even existed, let alone actually rose to the level of being a threat. So China has very successfully exploited this idea of the war on terror uh, and, that it, and that it faced a terrorist threat at home. It is, it is absolutely true that there have been violent incidents in Xinjiang, against civilians by Uyghurs, sometimes against the state. Um, but those in, <coughs> excuse me, no way justify the kinds of human rights violations that we're documenting there now. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, my name is Ryan Ming. I'm a uh, third semester student here. Um, I think it's unfortunate, but it's fair to say that some people, even in the United States, just don't care about human rights in other countries. Um, and especially like with the current administration, their national security strategy says that it's based on this principle of realism. And I, I joke that it's heavy on the realism and light on the principles. But um, how do you make the case to the, in this administration that they should care about human rights in Xinjiang? Like how does that tie back to US national security or American interests other than the, the really soft kind of smushy ideas of like advancing know, global human rights. Right. Well, first of all, it's relatively rare that anybody uh, in a position of authority acts purely because they care. Right? <laughs> that, that is one of the early and unpleasant lessons to learn. Um, and to be totally honest, if I had a buck for every time somebody in either of the Obama administrations told me how much they cared alongside how little they did, I could have retired probably five or six years ago. So that's the world we live in. Um, you know, it's all about figuring out what any given government's, person's, agency's interests are and playing to that. Everybody, I mean, look, very few people are going to sit and say to you, I don't care about human rights. Um, but very few people are genuinely going to do all they can simply because they just believe in that and it's the right thing to do. So, you know, if this administration is, well, um, I'll, I'll leave the discussions about U.S. domestic policy to my colleagues who work on the U.S. all day, but suffice it to say, you know, there's a reason you're not seeing a lot of letters from Human Rights Watch to President Trump, um, which is largely about his particular credibility or lack thereof on these issues. That said, there are plenty of people in the administration who have, I think, a much more uh, clear-eyed, hard-nosed view of China and in some ways are actually willing to act on that. Uh, you know, which is why, for example, you know, I think you saw uh, some clear outreach to Tsai Ing-wen last year. You know, there are people in the administration who say, look, if we like democracies, let's go be nice to that one or pay a little more attention to it. Okay, you know, I, that's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, so people, some of the issues that, that do motivate people in the current administration have to do with, you know, China as a security threat so there's plenty more interest, for example, in this administration than in the previous administration about what the Huawei's and the iFly checks and the hike visions of the world are doing, um, both for what that means in China and other parts of the world, but also what it could mean here. Uh, there is certainly you know, very vocal concern about religious freedom. Uh, and you know, to the extent that there were good outcomes from the religious Freedom Ministerial in July, it's in July, um, that the State Department hosted, you know, we heard a lot of very good, tough rhetoric about, for example, abuses of 
Muslims in Xinjiang. Not going to argue with that either. And this administration is, I mean, it's, it's hard to make a comparison here because the Global Magnitsky Act is so new. For those of you who are not familiar with it, this is a new legal term that allows the U.S. to impose sanctions and visa bans on people who've incredibly alleged to have committed human rights violations in other countries. And, you know, they like it, <laughs> and they're using it. Uh, it's a little bit, meaning the administration is signing off on Magnitsky designations saying, you know, this person cannot come to the U.S. or that person's assets will be frozen. It was so new in the Obama administration, it's, you know, it's not really fair to speculate about what they would have done had they had more time. Um, you know, but the administration is making good use of that tool. You know, <laughs> also, excuse me, sorry, I'm terrible cold that won't go away. Um, yeah, they've been more willing than other governments to stand up in certain forums and tell the Chinese government they think they're wrong. You know, the, it was, the U.S. was the only government to vote against that rotten resolution back in March. The only one. Australia abstained. Germany abstained. Germany, right? Angela Merkel says to Xi Jinping every single time she shows up in Beijing, what the hell is wrong with you on human rights? <laughs> every single time. And they abstained on this resolution. <laughs> What's wrong with you? And they actually said they didn't want to do it, or a couple of, they didn't, Germans didn't say that, a couple of governments said to us that they had abstained because they didn't want to be aligned with the U.S. <laughs> Guys, come on, keep your eyes on the prize here. You know, which is the bigger problem? Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it is admittedly a difficult operating environment because few of, fewer of the tools that we would usually use are available to us because of the credibility problems. But the U.S. isn't down now, uh, and it's about finding the people who are actually willing to do certain things, you know, and pitching to their interests, which is what we do all day. And um, the other, I mean, one other benefit of the administration's posture is that many members of Congress are much more engaged on foreign policy issues than they have been. And again, you know, so they'll all say that they've always cared deeply about the issue. Um, some of them are caring a lot more now than they have in the past, and that's that's helpful to have those alternatives or those, those counterweights. So hopefully that helps explain a little bit how we think about these things. In the back, and then come to you. Yeah, go ahead. You, yeah. So hey, my name's Byron. Um, we're in California, and I'm a student here. Um, so it's, uh, over the summer, I did some research on Chinese civil and political rights. And I was surprised to find that after a survey was done in China, um, well, the survey found that people are aware that they're being censored heavily, but and, and they know that they could easily circumvent that censorship through different technology platforms like VPNs and things like that. Um, but it's, a, it's inconvenient to do so, and so they just don't. And that probably doesn't speak for the entire population, but uh, I was really surprised to find that people just they may not care that much. And it seems to me that it's really important to get a population to care about a particular rights issue in order to, I guess, create deeply uh, sustainable change. So I guess the question is, how can <clears throat> organizations like the Rights Watch, or even like technology companies that provide these like censorship circumvention methods um, better do their job in the face of the fact that maybe the population doesn't care about yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and there are about three different complicated parts to it. Um, if we we get asked this question a lot. You know, if if people across China are willing to hand over their data, you know, why should you be so worried about it? Or why shouldn't you care? To which I say, you know, if you've grown up in a context in which you have no expectation of privacy rights, you know, that's a perfectly logical response, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it's it's. It is very difficult, I think, for people to assert a right they've never enjoyed, uh, you know, and that would require probably uh, a pretty significant change in regime <laughs> to even really have a conversation about that. So I don't think it's, I realize this isn't quite what you were suggesting, but I had this tangle with a journalist a week or two ago. I don't think it's quite fair to hold against a population a lack of concern about not having a right they've never had. Um, and that's why, but that's also, conversely, I think that's part of the reason why we fought so hard with a number of the big Western tech companies about going into China, about not lowering their standards. Uh, you know, and some medicine certainly made it very clear that they preferred using certain kinds of foreign technology or ISPs if they could 
because they believed it was safer, because they believed their data would be protected. So I don't think there's no awareness or impulse about that. Um, I think to the extent that you know, there's some surveys that suggest that uh, the social credit system is popular, I think that's as much a statement about a lack of confidence, particularly in the legal system, to provide any kind of accountability or in the state media to provide any kind of independent information. Right? That people are looking for some system that will apply rules consistently and will penalize people who violate them. Um, I think that's a, that's a logical thing to want, and when you can't get it through a legal system or political, you know, democratic political representation or a free press, uh, you know, other alternatives might seem logically appealing. Um, you know, but I think <laughs> for people, you know, once, you, once you've had some sense of what it is actually like to have your privacy protected, you would probably have a very different perception of some of those issues. Yeah. Well, along those lines, uh, my name is Rush Reed, uh, practicing attorney first uh, semester. Um, uh, he sort of asked the question that I was going to ask, but uh, to put it in a, in a different way. Um, you had mentioned the, um, you know, Google and Microsoft and um, going in and, you know, f making a buck. Um, I mean, obviously, those aren't human rights organizations and they don't care. But um, on the larger scale, what are your thoughts on just simply the fact that it's getting technology out there? I mean, the fact that the government, look, the government's always going to use it to watch us. It's doing it here. I mean, we're just not as, you know, overt and, uh, 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 I don't know, so much pressure on, on the, the populace. But, you know, the, that technology or just the fact that more and more citizens have access cuts both ways. I think it's pretty clear now that it's not cutting both ways. <laughs> I mean, what we, have, what we have observed over the last 10 or 15 years is the establishment of an internet ecosystem that is or can be entirely cut off from the rest of the world, right? It is a separate, a different, a distinct internet. You know, and for a long time, tech companies would say to us, isn't it better that we're there helping open a little space than not? You know, and we can now say, you know, with a hell of a lot of information to back it up, what you guys did was help the Chinese government build a much better mousetrap. And when you could have fought for privacy rights or for there to be one internet to which people all over the world had equal access regardless of where they were standing or what regime they were under, you chose not to do that. You capitulated. You didn't fight back. You complied with censorship demands without even fighting back against them or objecting. You know, and now we're in a day and age where you see things like Dragonfly, right? Which was Google's effort to design <laughs> censorship software with the Chinese government. You know, so I, I am well and truly done with anybody from or representing a tech company that tries to stand up and say, we're just trying to do the right thing. No, forget it. Next. Yeah, um, so, on that same topic, sorry, my name is Conrad. Um, I'm the first year student here. I used to be a software engineer. Um, clearly, Google, with its refusal to work on Project Maven, or refusal to continue its work on Project Maven for the Defense Department, has some capacity for activism from its employees to affect its decision making. And so, when you say they're just trying to make a buck, to me, that it's clear that they're not always only trying to do that. So do you have any insight into the culture of the people making these decisions and maybe the employees more broadly? No, Are they willing to step up in one case and seemingly mostly unwilling to step up in another case right. in the China case? No, it's, it's a great point because clearly within some of these companies, there's been a lively discussion <laughs> of late about you know whether these policies are right, whether, even, whether people even really understood <laughs> what they were working on or who the client was. And it's certainly very encouraging to see employees saying, wait a minute, <laughs> you, have, you, our employers, have to be honest with us about these things. You know, in some cases, we've seen people quit and explain publicly that they're doing so because they don't have confidence in, in their employer's honesty about you know, who the ultimate <coughs> client is or what the technology uh, is being designed for. Um, but you know the leadership of those companies has not, I think, 
really you know, taken any particular steps or made commitments to refrain from those practices. And again, I mean, the fight we were having 10 years ago was about how, you know, how, to, how they should try to maintain their standards if and when they went into China. Now the conversation is about the fact you know, that they're actively complicit, or at least some of them are actively complicit in helping build better software, better censorship software for the Chinese government. Uh, and I think that's a, a discouraging trend line. There are some fantastic organizations. Again, I am so technologically inept, I will not explain this well. But there are some amazing organizations that do nothing but design you know, VPNs that do great circumvention technology work that try to disseminate that stuff, that do all sorts of you know, kind of underground online training about <coughs> excuse me, keeping data safe and things like that. So there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole world of people out there who I think are doing all of the right things in the tech space. Um, yeah, but some of these companies that could have really taken a stand and I think defended a certain kind of standard worldwide just chose not to. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Simon McGaugh, <coughs> I'm from the Czech Republic student here. Uh, I wanted to ask what's the role, of, what role does the EU play in uh, promoting uh, rights in China? If any. <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> well, that's 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 six books. That question. Um, you know, as is the case with a lot of things, when the EU speaks with one voice, it is a disproportionately powerful player. It does not often get its act together to do that. Um, you know, and it's been badly split in recent years. Um, you know, largely as, excuse me, China has either pursued other kinds of organizing vehicles, the 16 plus one mechanism that involves a lot of Southern and Eastern European countries, um, you know, or where, excuse me, particular inducements have been offered to a specific government to ensure that there's no consensus. A lot of certain kinds of EU diplomatic initiatives require consensus across all the member states. And boy, is China good at, at finding a couple of the weak links and picking them off. So there was a particular diplomatic train wreck uh, last summer at the Human Rights Council when for the first time ever and the EU could not present a statement about China's human rights record because Greece objected and blocked the consensus. Uh, yeah, Hungary is hugely problematic, although we'll see what happens uh, you know, as, as the EU has finally <laughs> decided to have a word with Hungary about the fact that it's really pulling in the opposite direction from stated EU values. And uh, I gather the possibility of stripping, the, stripping Hungary of its actual voting rights within the EU uh, is not a likely outcome, but whether it can sort of be chastened or its ability to block a consensus can otherwise be limited, you know, would help enormously on a lot of China-related issues. But you know, if you talk to all 28 or 27, however you want to count it these days, member states, you know, often many of the smaller ones will give you the opposite of the, the logic of being in the EU and say, well, we don't want to be tough on China because we're small and vulnerable, to which we say, wasn't that the point of being part of the EU? And they'll say, well, you know, we're uniquely vulnerable, to which you say, come on. Uh, some of these arguments are really tedious. Uh, you know, these things can also change enormously depending on a particular ambassador or uh, in Beijing, <coughs> excuse me, or on the leadership in Brussels. I mean, one of our greatest frustrations is that even when you get a pretty good performance by, for example, uh, the EU ambassador and other key senior leadership positions, you know, Juncker and Tusk will, as they did this summer, roll into Beijing for a summit, you know, literally days after the EU has had another catastrophically counterproductive bilateral human rights dialogue with China, and say nothing about human rights issues. You know, and there's sort of a, the EU as a diplomatic machine is incredibly frustrating to work with. Um, I don't mind lousy governments having to deal with 28 of them all mushed together is really crazy making. I don't know how my colleagues in Brussels do it. Um, you know, but 
very hard to get that machinery to really accept, I think, a good understanding of the Chinese political context, which really requires that certain messages get delivered by senior leaders at certain kinds of occasions, and that if they don't do that, you know, if Tusk and Juncker don't do that, uh, you know, Mogherini has been very inconsistent on this, uh, that, you know, you can have a lot of the other kinds of diplomatic interventions on human rights issues with the Chinese government, and it will ignore them all, right? It matters what senior leaders say publicly when they are standing in Beijing. And in that sense, the EU is a disaster. They're terrible at it. You know, they'll occasionally <coughs> offer a few tougher rhetoric if they're standing in the comforts of Brussels. Um, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of perennially disappointing performance given how effective it could be, and like many other governments, it's perfectly willing to be tough about things like, you know, steel tariffs or the South China Seas or chicken meat or solar panels, right? Then it's willing to be plenty tough. You ask them these things, not so much. But again, you know, we live in a day and age where European citizens are getting arbitrarily detained in China. Uh, when you're watching the Chinese government harass EU citizens in EU countries, and it's not pushing back there very effectively. Yeah, there's at least one other question. Yes, in that part. Um, my name is Yuri Nevis. I'm originally from Boston. Um, so you mentioned uh, Western technology companies quite a bit. What legal mechanisms, if any, are there that the US, if willing, uh, could take <laughs> against these companies uh, in terms of them aiding these authoritarian regimes? Yeah, there's a whole universe of uh, mechanisms by which companies have to get licenses to export certain kinds of technology. Um, the problem with the way that world works, especially for technology, is that you know what's what's restricted or prohibited. The list, or the, the understanding of the lists of what's restricted or prohibited, in no way keep up with the technology, which is just evolving so incredibly quickly. Uh, and so. You know, well, you still can't, here's a good example. You know, it's still illegal for any US-based entity to sell handcuffs to Chinese police or other state entities, but US companies sell everything you would need to make a pair of handcuffs, right? <laughs> also, let me give you another example. We, in the course of um, some of our research last year, discovered that a Waltham-based uh, medical technology firm called Thermo Fisher Scientific, which I've never heard of before, um, but apparently it employs 60,000 people worldwide, um, sells DNA sequencers to the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau. To which we said, really? <laughs> Do we really think that's a good idea, as my best friend's mother says? Um, and, you know, Thermo Fisher got very nervous when we wrote them, and the first thing they said back to us was, we have all the right licenses, we're not breaking the law. And we said, we didn't say you were breaking the law, we're asking you what due diligence mechanisms you have in place to ensure that your goods and services are not contributing to human rights violations. They sent us a law saying, we have all the right licenses, we're not breaking the law, and science is nice. <laughs> we said, we're good with science. You like science, that's cool. Uh, the next letter came back saying, let see if I can get this right, saying, um, we have licenses, we haven't broken the law, science is nice, and they're, oh, that's right, you should, they're good uses for DNA sequencers, and you should be happy about that. Um, and that was that they could be used to identify human remains or match a missing kid uh, you know, who's been separated from parents. Great, we have no complaint with any of those things. How are you making sure? <laughs> right, because at the same time we were starting to write about these programs in which Xinjiang authorities were gathering DNA samples from people. And we were very clear that we did not have hard evidence to know that this company's sequencers were being used by the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau in that particular part of the campaign. But you know, you put these questions <laughs> either at an ethical or a legal level to companies and often will very quickly point out that they got the right licenses. Our view is that the law isn't keeping up with the technology, both for export purposes and to a large extent for import purposes as well, but also that not nearly enough, uh, you know, not nearly enough companies are going through any sort of due diligence exercises as the UN's guiding principles on human rights and business require them to do, 
here to make sure that their practices aren't worse in this situation. And actually, how many people here are another universe I don't understand at all? How many people here are uh, basketball fans, professional basketball? Fewer than I would have thought at Georgetown. I thought you people were mad about basketball. Um, you know, I nearly fell off my chair about a month ago when a journalist friend of ours wrote a piece for foreign policy pointing out that the NBA has a training camp in Xinjiang. I sort of thought, oh God, what? <laughs> you know, so we're, we're having a little conversation with them saying, are you sure that your business practice is <laughs> not in any way contributing to human rights violations? You know, I, I'm reasonably confident that, that the FBA is not in any way promoting the mass incarceration of Muslims in China. <laughs> but you want, you want some acknowledgement from a company that it has some sense of the environment it's operating in and that <laughs> you know, it knows what it's doing and who it's working with because there's no way the NBA is running anything uh, that doesn't have the permission of the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau. <laughs> you know, and in that sense, it has some obligation to acknowledge that it's interacting with a major human rights violator that, you know, if, if we and others have things our way, the U.S. Congress will be soon dramatically limiting business with. Uh, the lack of awareness is really kind of remarkable, but the, you know, the, the legal framework is frustrating. It's frustrating in this realm. It's one thing if you're talking about certain kinds of agricultural products, but you know, we, we spent you know, a couple of weeks trying to figure out if there was merit in trying to make the case that nobody should be able to sell DNA sequencers. But we realized very quickly we weren't going to win that argument because there are legitimate uses for it. And the reality is also that within another couple of years, Chinese companies are probably going to be producing DNA sequencers of their own that are of sufficient quality that they won't feel the need to seek uh, Western-made ones anymore. And so in that sense, the laws only get you so far these days. Or export controls. Yeah. Is that, Tom, is that you? All yeah, the way back? I can't really see. I, I'm a retired professor and I invited you and I apologize for not being here to introduce you and traffic around the best world. Anyway, you know, uh, this is an unfair question, but we're almost done, so let me ask it anyway. I don't think this is sustainable. I mean, we've seen the Communist Party go off the rails and great leap forward in the 50s, the Cultural Revolution. We blame that on Mao. They all came to an end, and everybody looks back and says, that was really stupid or really destructive. Now we've got a Chinese leader who is said to have consolidated power even more than Mao, who's trying to, you know, to control everyone to an almost insidious level. I, I, uh, maybe I'm just naively faithful to the human spirit, but I, just, I think this has to unravel at some point. Either, either kind of peacefully, you know, she just backs off a bit, or, or in an ugly way. And I wonder if, if you see signs of elite resistance. I mean, the Xi's colleagues aren't uncomfortable, you know, like Deng was uncomfortable with Mao in the 70s, or, or popular resistance that might have a potential to spread. Let me try to break that. Excuse me, break that down a little bit. I mean, at elite levels, sure. I think there's always a certain amount of pushing and shoving, uh, and the question is how visible that is to the outside world, and what kinds of penalties accrue to people who push too hard against the people who are in power. Uh, we have, there was a very well publicized trial a few years ago of Bo Xi Lai, who was the Chongqing Party secretary. Uh, you know, and that was, I think, very much a cautionary tale. I mean, he had a certain amount of popularity in Chongqing for anti-crime campaigns. Uh, and I think he was a particular target for Xi as a way of saying to other potential challengers, don't even think about it. And he's essentially disappeared off the grid into state custody and hasn't been heard from since. Um, but you know, another category of elites, I, I occasionally point out that one of the post-grad programs I did in China that was a mix of international students and Chinese students, um, as of a couple of years ago, almost all of my Chinese counterparts from that program either had moved full-time to other countries or had you know, planted a flag someplace else. And you know, for the, the people that I've kept in touch with, I happen to look around the corner from one of my Chinese classmates from that program, so we often wind up hosting people who are coming through town. That a lot of people made that decision for their, we all have kids roughly the same age, and that a lot of people made the decision essentially that they wanted to raise their kids in very different environments. And they didn't want them going to schools in China, they wanted to get out of, you know, less the environmental pollution. Um, you know, and I'm always, whenever, especially with, you know, 
small governments that say, well, we're weak. There's only so much we can do. One of the questions I always put to governments is, how long is the visa line outside your embassy? You know, how many people are, <laughs> how many people are looking to either emigrate or you know, have some kind of a toehold outside China? I think people are voting with their feet when they can. Um, you know, and then amongst you know, sort of different uh, groups of you know, of of workers, we've just seen an extraordinary, roughly six week long protest by truck drivers uh, over pay and working conditions. There was a remarkable protest this summer by retired members of the military over lack of access to benefits. Um, you know, in, in each of these cases, typically what the government will do is concede a little bit or enough to get people off the streets um, or certainly away from long lens uh, cameras of, of international media uh, and sort of negotiate some minor changes, but nothing systemic or longer term. Uh, you know, what this looks like 10 years from now, I, I find it very hard to predict. Uh, what I do find depressing is that, you know, we're 40 years into the purported reform and opening era and you're no more able to you know, start an independent newspaper or run for political office, you know, or stand on a street corner holding a sign about, you know, public officials' asset disclosure, you know, with a line that's from some senior leader's speech, you know, and not expect to get dragged away and sentenced to five years on a ridiculous charge of picking quarrels and stirring up troubles. You know, it's 2018. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I do worry what both China looks like and what its consequences or its effects on the rest of the world are if we have another 40 years that look like the last. That's a really depressing note to end on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I've got time for one more and then I have to deal with an ANSI journalist. <laughs> Nobody wants a job? Nobody wants to talk about career stuff? Really? That's amazing. This has never happened to me on campus before. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I have one sort of career job. Uh, could you sort of roughly trace your trajectory in your education that got you to this point now? Yes. Uh -huh. So I have a, a, a BA from Oberlin, which is where I started studying Chinese. And it was the, the first semester uh, of my sophomore year. It was August of 1989 <laughs> that my Oberlin program went. Uh, two months after Tiananmen to Kunming for a semester. And I'm so astonished that we were allowed to go. And actually, somebody asked earlier about formative moments. I remember getting to Kunming, and a lot of the Chinese students, we, we went there because we could have Chinese roommates. Um, and a lot of the students didn't move in with us for about a month because they were finishing classes that had been suspended the previous semester because of the protests. And I certainly remember being 19. Uh, you know, and we were from Oberlin, right? So everybody was all up and and upset and advocating about everything, even though we had no idea what we were talking about. Um, <laughs> because that was what you did. Uh, and I remember standing in the building that we lived in, which was just outside the university wall, and seeing these you know, people my own age you know, who were going to class at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we'd break for lunch at noon, and they'd still be sitting there. We'd go back to class at 2, they'd still be sitting there. We'd get out at 5, they'd still be sitting there. We'd go to dinner, they'd still be sitting there. Right? I mean, watching people have to sit through what we later you know, understood was essentially political education you know, for days and days and days and days. And that was, you know, it's, it's an image that floats through my head from time to time. So that was, and I remember thinking, you know, how did I get lucky enough to not have to do that? Uh, I finished Oberlin. I went to the Hopkins Nanjing program, which is mostly a language program. Um, after I finished, I then was at, amazingly, peculiarly, I was at CSIS for two years. Um, realized that was not so much my environment. I went to work for an organization called the National Democratic Institute, where I was supposed to start working on China projects, but wound up getting sent to Cambodia instead, which was a little brain bending. But um, among other things, it introduced me in the following order to the guy who's now my boss, um, the topic about which I wrote my dissertation, and the lovely gentleman who's been my husband for many years now. Um, I then went to UVA and got a PhD in political science because by that point of, I just found myself thinking, why do some countries wind up with more and less democratic governments? How does this happen? And I wound up writing about a very different topic, which is about Chinese foreign policy towards Cambodia. Um, and along the way, you know, I'd stayed in touch with various human rights watch people and done consulting work. And as I was wrapping up my dissertation, uh, and <laughs> inconveniently, right around the same time I was finishing my dissertation and having a baby, 
Um, I was offered a job in New York with Human Rights Watch, and we were actually living in New Zealand at the time, which is where my husband is from. Um, and I think I found having a brand new baby so daunting that I thought moving across the earth and taking a job with Human Rights Watch in New York sounded totally doable, <laughs> which in retrospect was insane. Um, but we did it, and many years later, here I am. But you know, what was great about here was here's what was great about getting a PhD: learning how to you know design and execute good research, learning how to go out and get funding for it, you know, selling it to a committee, which is like persuading people to adopt a new policy. Um, you know, learning how to write well. Uh, you know, because a decent chunk of my job now is helping researchers design and carry out research, and I edit everything that we publish on China. Um, so grad school is particularly good for that. Uh, you know, but language skills, arguing, writing, all good things to try to do. But hopefully that's, that's helpful to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to meet all of you. Thanks for